Veicināti paneļu diskusijas, nu, jeb šīs konferences otrajā daļā. Welcome back to the second part of this conference, and I am happy to see that we are quite a large number after the coffee break. And also it's clear which is the best place in this room, because you are kind of concentrated in one segment. Probably there are better seats, but it's okay. It's good. And I hope it will also help you to perceive and also understand what the panelists are going to speak. And therefore, I would like uh, to spread an honor uh, to introduce uh, Mr. George Ulrich, who is the Academic Director, Global Campus of Human Rights Director, Visiting Professor at the Riga Graduate School of Law. He's going to be the moderator of the panel discussion. And in this uh, panel discussion, the participants will be the Head of Human Rights uh, of Yara International, Lisa Berg, and also uh, very honorable colleagues. Uh, the chief advisor of Danish Institute for Human Rights, Gabriel Holly, and also Enact um, Sustainable uh, Strategy Senior Advisor, Roger M. Benning, and uh, the Polish uh, Institute for Human Rights and Business uh, President, uh, Beata Paracic. This is going to be our panelists, and uh, when we will have uh, the Q&A session, then also on the state real property representatives, Mrs. Uh, Sarmit was always going to join our discussion, but this is going to be the next part. So this is this was introduction, and now I'm going to give the mic to George. Thank you. Um, hello to everyone. I'm very happy to the organizers for inviting me, and I'm very happy to be back in Riga. I was for seven years here uh, rector at the Riga Graduate School of Law, and it's so nice to be back and to see the institution flourish. I thought I would start my very short presentation with a personal anecdote, if I may. Um, I started in the field of international human rights in, 19, in early 1999, on March 1st, 1999, where I became senior researcher at the Danish Institute for Human Rights. I started on the same day as another colleague who was named Margaret Jonk. She had been hired uh, by the Danish Institute to start a research project on business and human rights. And it was kind of a new topic, pioneering, groundbreaking, explorative. That turned into the creation of a business and human rights department in the Danish Institute for Human Rights, which became hugely important both internally and uh, in servicing the wider community. So she really had an important topic. And I think what, what this tells me is that the um, field of business and human rights has been going through a development from an early stage of a lot of creative, fertile, innovative approaches that were all over the place. People came at the topic from many different angles with a lot of inspiration, with a lot of ideas, but no unified or formal structure. The mandate of the UN Special Representative John Ruggie pulled all the different strands and uh, inspirations and ideas together into a unified structure, which we know now as the United Nations Guiding Principles, which in many ways uh, simply have defined the field of, of business and human rights as we know it, um, and, and uh, given us the focus of the three pillars that, that we are uh, thinking through and, and working with. Um, and, but this happened uh, in light of a lot of activities that were already going on, and very often also led by and inspired not just by academics, not just by human rights institutions, but also by businesses themselves. Businesses in many ways charged a path in, in this field. And, uh, and the consultancy work of an institute like the Danish Institute for Human Rights engaged businesses and set standards, set examples, set models for how this field can be, can be further developed. The third phase that we're now entering into and in the middle of is to give legally binding force to the, to the core ideas and standards of the, of the UN guiding principles and what we heard earlier today about the sustainability, due diligence directive, also the work towards a legally binding instrument in the United Nations framework and so on, are really building on the uh, UN guiding principles, but to give legal definition and legal force to it. And, this, and we're sort of in midstream as far as that is going, and, and it's not entirely encouraging what we're seeing also, one, one could say. But meanwhile, and this is the point I wanted to make, businesses continue to work with due diligence and continue to... Uh, 
take up responsibility as socially responsible agents, some businesses at least. And I think the panel here today is going to share experiences of how businesses have continued to chart a path with regard to embracing uh, the responsibility for the realization and implementation of the international human rights framework. And I think we continue to rely on business uh, partners and business enterprises, and we continue to learn also from business enterprises and what is being done. And with that, I am very happy. And this, of course, will focus primarily on the second pillar of the UN guiding principles, which is the complementarity between the first pillar of responsibilities of government to regulate uh, businesses and to protect human rights, and the responsibilities of businesses to do their part. Uh, and then there's a shared third responsibility for, for redress and remedies, uh, as, as I'm sure you're, you, you know and are familiar with. So our focus now will be primarily on the second pillar, on how businesses can maintain their, um, their corporate responsibility to respect human rights and to work in compliance with international human rights standards, notably by conducting uh, human rights due diligence. So with that, I'm very happy to welcome the first speaker of the panel, Lisa Berg. Uh, and uh, we look forward to hearing your experiences of working with, um, with uh, corporate due diligence. Thank you very much. It's on. Yes, thank you. Thank you uh, so much for that uh, introduction, and thank you so much for inviting me to, uh, to participate in this conference. Uh, I think this is a very relevant topic uh, these days, in particular with everything going on with this uh, EU uh, directive. Um, and I'm very excited to be here today and to be able to share a little bit on how we work with human rights due diligence at Yara. So just to give a little context uh, first, Yara is a global fertilizer company. We have about 17,000 employees uh, across the world. We have operations in 60 countries, sales to 160 countries, uh, and a complex uh, value chain spanning from uh, sourcing of raw materials to our own production sites, logistics and distribution of products, sales to farmers, etc. And we have about 40,000 tier one uh, suppliers. So this means that our sort of human rights uh, landscape is quite uh, complex. We operate in many countries with known human rights challenges, also in context and industries. Um, and this means that we need to have a risk-based approach to, uh, to our human rights work. Otherwise, this task would be uh, hugely overwhelming. Um, Yara falls under the uh, Tr uh, Norwegian Transparency Act, which has been mentioned here today. This means that we have to conduct our human rights due diligence in line with the UN guiding principles and the OECD guidelines. And uh, there's a lot of text on this slide, uh, but I just wanted to include it just to show that we've kind of structured our sustainability and human rights due diligence to be in line with the OECD guidelines. Um, and I'll uh, try to give some practical examples of uh, how we work with human rights due diligence within each of these uh, six elements here. So on the first point there on policies and procedures, we have integrated human rights into existing policies, procedures, and management systems. So that includes uh, our code of conduct, for instance, our business partner code of conduct, anything related to supplier compliance management policies and procedures, and also into our compliance program. So that means that human rights is integrated into all the elements of our compliance program which includes uh, integrity due diligence and business partner monitoring, uh, training and communication uh, of our own employees, reporting to executive management and the board uh, on human rights issues, uh, and risk assessments, uh, for instance. And I think this is a key point. You don't necessarily have to make anything on the side, sort of new human rights policies. Look at what you have and see where you can integrate uh, human rights uh, into policies uh, and management systems that are known uh, in the organization and that you already work uh, under. And when it comes to the second point on identifying human rights uh, impacts, um, here we have several measures uh, in place, and this goes for our own operations and our supply and value chain, which is the scope of the, the OECD guidelines and the UN guiding principles. So here we have a human rights and geopolitical risk assessment, for example, looking at, okay, where are we located? What are our countries of operations? 
what are we doing in each of these countries? How many employees do we have? What's our sourcing spend? What's our sales? We look at external indices for human rights risk, anti-corruption risk, sanctions, business risk. And that gives us a kind of starting point to prioritize, to see where should we do human rights impact assessments, for example. Uh, in what countries should we prioritize looking at uh, suppliers and supply chain and industry risk? Uh, and we've conducted uh, eight human rights impact assessments over the past years uh, across our operations. And these have been very valuable exercises in terms of understanding what uh, are human rights in a Yara context. And it's very easy to kind of get lost in the human rights uh, language, but it makes it very tangible both for the, the local uh, management and operations, but also reporting to executive management on the board. What is human rights risk in a Yara context? So a uh, very uh, hot tip to uh, conduct human rights due diligence uh, or human rights impact assessments. When it comes to our supply and value chain, we have uh, several measures in place here. Um, we have our integrity due diligence process. Uh, which requires us to risk assess all new business partners. We have a supplier compliance management policy and procedure. We have a global audit program that was piloted last year, focusing on human and labor rights. Um, we have Ecovaldis sustainability assessments of our suppliers. Um, and we have requirements towards our suppliers in our business partner code of conduct. And like I mentioned in the beginning, we have about 40,000 just tier one suppliers. So we have to have a risk-based approach in terms of how we uh, sort of risk assess and prioritize and determine which suppliers, which industries should we have a, a closer look at and what type of activity should we do towards uh, these suppliers. When it comes to point three, seize, prevent and mitigate adverse impacts, we have uh, or where we have identified actual or potential impact, for example, through uh, human rights impact assessments uh, or uh, social audits. We have uh, actions that we put in place for the human rights impact assessments. We have local action plans that are monitored and followed up locally. We report on the progress to executive management on the board. Uh, and we have also implemented, for instance, local programs across Yara, where we have found in these human rights impact assessments that we have similar, um, similar risks and impacts across the board. So, for example, on living wage, this was identified in uh, some of the, the human rights impact assessments. Uh, and here we initiated a global project across Yara to ensure that all Yara employees are paid a living wage. Uh, and then we will also start this year to see how we can involve contractors in this project. Uh, another key finding in our human rights impact assessments were related to physical work environment. So manual handling uh, of fertilizer bags, for instance, working in uh, high temperatures, uh, piece rate pay combined with this. So here we uh, implemented a global policy on physical work environment to ensure that we have the same standard uh, across the board. Uh, when it comes to tracking implementation and results, uh, like I mentioned, we have regular status monitoring of the human rights impact assessment action plans. We have, uh, last year, we also conducted internal audits uh, of three of the human rights impact assessments. And I think this is key, uh, well, actually, this whole point is key on tracking effectiveness of your measures. Because we went back and did an audit of the actions that we had uh, agreed on to see whether they were effectively implemented. Talking to stakeholders again to check, okay, this action, has this led to intended results? And for many of the actions, yes, uh, we could say that they had done. But for others, uh, they were not as effective or we had new findings as well. So that led us to this year try to formalize this human rights impact assessment process into kind of a plan, do, check, act uh, process wheel to ensure that we always go back and talk to stakeholders and sort of uh, ensure that this is continuously followed up. It's very easy for these exercises to become kind of tick off and then you put it in a drawer and, uh, and you're finished. But uh, 
uh, that will not uh, help the, the stakeholders affected uh, and uh, would just be a pointless exercise. Um, yes, so on point five, communicate how impacts are addressed. Uh, we have our annual human rights uh, disclosures in our sustainability report and integrated report. We also uh, report on the modern, or on three modern slavery acts, uh, in fact, this year, published a modern slavery statement. And this is also a requirement for us under the Transparency Act to publish how we conduct our due diligence, what have been our findings, what have been our actions, um, and hopefully also under the, the CS uh, triple D uh, eventually. <laughs> Let's cross our fingers. <laughs> uh, on the last point there, provide for remediation. Um, it'll be a repetition, but uh, a point here is to follow up on the human rights impact assessments uh, and on these uh, global projects that we have initiated. We also have a hotline that is available to every uh, stakeholder, both internal and external, so that we ensure that we have some way that uh, our stakeholders can, uh, can reach out to us if they need to report uh, grievances or concerns. Uh, and then we have an established investigation uh, procedure to ensure that any grievances that we receive, that these are followed up in a structured uh, way, every single one and every single time. So I think I'll uh, leave it at that, but to summarize, um, I think some key takeaways hopefully will be, um, look at the, the UN guiding principles, uh, look at the OECD guidelines, the latter in particular, they have some very practical action points per each of these six elements. Look at what you have in place already, see where you can integrate human rights into existing policies and procedures. And I think the most important thing for this whole discussion today should be, and I was mentioned here earlier as well, remember why you are doing this. It's easy to get lost in, okay, we've conducted this and this many audits this year, and we've done a human rights impact assessment that we can report on. But the point is to create sort of a better work environment for anyone working uh, for you in your operations or impacted by your product or uh, or in the vicinity of your operations. Thank you. Thank you, too. Um, interesting. And you follow very clearly the structure of the UN guiding principles also going through the, the main components, and I think that's very helpful. I don't know if other panelists would like to uh, immediately react to the presentation we can also, we can pool together different inputs. Uh, I don't know. Roger, did you? Yeah, especially the last comment you made about why we're doing this. I think you're right. It's too often the case that these processes become mechanical and take on sort of a life of their own because they're focused on inputs, what the company does, and not outcomes, how people are affected. And I think any kind of effective system needs to cover both. Um, it's important to set milestones and performance targets for what companies do, but also in the end to be able to measure whether they're actually changing the lives of people. Yeah, maybe just to, to add on that point, um, I think this has been a, a concern as the legal developments um, have, have, have you know, progressed and as we are seeing a trend toward the UNGPs finding their way into legal obligations. I think there's been a real concern that that will lead to a kind of checkbox compliance approach where um, rather than embracing the spirit of the UNGPs with this, um, as, as Lisa rightly said, you know, which have as, as their objective um, you know, protection of human rights and businesses accepting responsibility for the, the impacts they have on people and planet. We then have um, a kind of a slavish um, and dogmatic a application of legal standards and doing only what the bare minimum of the law requires um, rather than in kind of embracing um, the spirit of the instrument on in which the laws are based. And so I think regardless of where um, the legal development's go, if we have a CSDD or not, the UNGPs will still be there and will still be the, the guiding kind of framework the companies should be using. So I think that that will nonetheless be the touch point regardless of where we end up in the legal developments. I have maybe one, one question that I'll take the liberty to, to ask since uh, I'm holding the microphone. <laughs> um, 
it's impressive to hear what you're doing as a, and, and working in the field of uh, fertilizers and, and the chemical field and so on. I imagine there's also, there are potential real issues in, in your, your field of operation. And, and yet you're really, you're doing a lot. You're rising to, to really make a genuine attempt at, at, at working with the uh, United Nations Guiding Principles. Are you concerned that your competitors are not uh, rising to the same standard? Is that a problem for you as a, a, a global corporation? The issue of a level playing field, you know, the, is, is there a sense that, that you might lose competitive edge by being socially responsible? It's a good question, and I think, um, well, perhaps, but it doesn't really matter because we need to do this work uh, regardless. Achieving success in the, in the right way is a statement that our CEO is uh, very vocal about, mm -hmm. and if we can't do that, then we can't do business, basically. So, uh, but I think uh, in light of that, I think uh, a hard law legislation like the, the CSDD, it would help uh, level the playing field, uh, and it would help ensure that uh, all the players in our value chain as well uh, would uh, would operate in the same way to to everyone's common interest and common good. Exactly, that's uh, the next horizon. So yeah. to say. <laughs> I think we move on here to mm -hmm. um, Gabriel Holly, mm -hmm. representing the Danish Institute of Human Rights, um, mm -hmm. which is very dear to my heart. <laughs> Look forward to your presentation. Good, mine too. Um, yes, thank you very much. So um, what I've been asked to speak on today is to give a, a short introduction to identifying impacts um, uh, on people <clears throat> um, that the UNGPs expect. And I think that Lisa's already given us some really great examples of how Yara does that and the kinds of processes that, that are used. And I think that it's important to sort of um, emphasize that, as, as Lisa rightly says, um, that you don't need to create a kind of a parallel system um, for doing due diligence or doing any of the individual steps of due diligence. Rather, this is something that can be integrated into existing processes, provided that they have the objective of identifying risks to rights holders. I mean, companies, I think, are well accustomed to identifying risk to the business. I mean, this is something that all of you will do in some form or other um, in, your, in your work. Um, what is very different about the risk assessment process um, that is uh, envisaged under the UNGPs is that it is singularly focused on risks to rights holders. And that requires, I think, sometimes a shifting, uh, shifting your view using a slightly different lens, um, maybe uh, adapting processes to incorporate these human rights kind of considerations. But um, it, it is something that I think shouldn't be too uncomfortable because it is a, something that can be integrated into the way that you already work. So really it all begins with identification. Um, unless a company understands what impacts it has on people, it can't design effective interventions uh, to prevent and mitigate negative impacts. So really that is um, the first step. <clears throat> Uh, risks of impacts um, can arise from a range of factors. It can arise from the sector that you work in, um, the, the nature and, and the business model that you use, uh, the business relationships you have, the geographies in which you operate, um, the operating context, um, your business relationships. So there is a huge kind of mix of factors that can generate risk. Um, for companies getting started, I, I think uh, some kind of scoping exercise can be very useful to understand these potential sources of risk. Um, for a complex business, this can involve the creation of an initial kind of high-level picture of areas of operation and types of business relationships um, to understand what information might be relevant to gather for further assessment to really understand risk. Um, but I should stress that the UNGPs are a, a pragmatic document. Um, the identification process that you use will very much depend um, on the nature of your particular business. So um, how a multinational will go about identifying the risks that it has will be very different to an SME, for example. Um, so and the processes will be of a different scale and of a different nature. If you're a small business with a, a handful of suppliers that you know well, then you may not need to do a kind of a massive scoping exercise to sort of understand your operations and your context, but rather it'll be more about, um, again, using this different lens. Um, looking at your operations in a slightly different way, the operations that you already know well, but just looking at it with, with an eye to human rights standards. Um, and so I think that it's, it's, it's very much in a kind of an adaptable process. Um, 
So where an area of operations or a particular context or a line of business has been identified as being potentially high risk and, and needs of, uh, a need of prioritisation um, by the business because there are potentially quite severe risks associated with it, maybe you're in an operating context where there are challenges associated with forced labour or child labour, for example, um, then the company should undertake a much more in-depth assessment. Um, and this uh, can take the form of a human rights impact assessment that, that Lisa mentioned. Um, and it's a methodology that um, uh, my institution has worked on uh, quite a lot over the years and has developed quite a lot of tools and resources to, to help um, companies conduct human rights impact assessments. Um, it's a methodology that borrows very much from other um, more well-known and kind of um, much kind of longer standing impact assessment methodologies like environmental impact assessment and social impact assessment. Um, but where it differs from those kinds of impact assessment methodologies um, is that it first uses international human rights standards as the benchmark. So um, when you're undertaking the impact assessments, like your, kind of, your focus is very much on how, how kind of what you're assessing um, meets or does not meet international human rights standards. So that's the first. Um, secondly, um, it must be conducted by using a rights-based approach. Now, this is um, absolutely key to the process. Um, that means that um, it needs to adhere to principles of non-discrimination. Um, it needs to ensure good participation of rights holders. Um, it needs to um, facilitate empowerment of communities who are participating in the process. Um, that's the other kind of really critical component here. If you're not using a rights-based approach when conducting a human rights impact assessment, you're not conducting a human rights impact assessment. I think that's key. And uh, stakeholder consultation and involvement is absolutely critical to the process, and I know Beata will speak more on that um, when she comes to speak. Um, yeah, so uh, a, a thorough assessment of human rights um, really isn't likely to be possible or effective if it's conducted purely as a desktop exercise. So although a human rights impact assessment will include um, a kind of a desktop component, I think that there's often a need to kind of... Uh, go into the field, go into the sites, um, speak to workers, speak to communities who are affected, um, and ensure that you're speaking to them in a way that ensures that their voice can be heard properly. So making sure that consultations are designed in a way that um, uh, ensures participation, makes, uh, that removes barriers to participation. I think it's really important to sort of design the process as well. Otherwise, um, I think, as sort of Lisa said, you may end up with a kind of checkbox compliance exercise um, where you, you, sort of, you appear to have uh, consulted, but you haven't really consulted kind of um, in reality. Um, so, uh, yeah, as I said, there are sort of the two kind of really critical essential components are using human rights as a benchmark and using a rights-based approach, focusing on the participation of rights holders, but also, I think, for having a focus on accountability. Um, the assessment process and content really do need to emphasise this. Um, and I think that um, Lisa's comment about, you know, ensuring good follow-up of human rights impact assessments is a really kind of important component of the process to make sure that you, you do a human rights impact assessment, you identify the impacts, you come up with some recommendations for, for designing appropriate actions, then what? Um, you need to make sure that those actions are put into place and you're assessing whether or not they're effective. Again, just mirroring the other steps of the, the human rights due diligence process. Um, so I must say that HRAs are a very involved process um, when done well. Um, and um, it's not necessary that every company will need to do these in every context that they um, operate in. Um, these are really, I think, generally best suited to the identification of a particular impact that occurs in a particular context or geography or product line, or which may occur, you know, um, by triggered by, for example, the entry into a new market or, or a kind of a new acquisition or something like that. Um, but for a lot of companies that, that are smaller or the risks profiles are a bit different, um, you may need a slightly lighter process than a, than a full human rights impact assessment. Um, as I said, my institution has developed um, a kind of a fairly extensive handbook on human rights impact assessment processes, which is very um, pedagogical and very practical um, uh, to kind of provide kind of good granular guidance on how to conduct impact assessments. And a lot of the, um, the learnings that you can take from there can be applied with, in lighter processes. So we have, for example, a kind of... Uh, a fairly um, lengthy supplement on stakeholder engagement and good principles for stakeholder engagement. That's something that can be used in the context of an HRAA, but can also be used um, in kind of in, in other processes that you're using to engage with stakeholders. Um, as well, there are other kind of, as, as Lisa mentioned, a few, but there are other existing processes that a company can use to kind of identify and monitor risk on an ongoing basis. 
Um, so this can be the kind of the usual enterprise level risk management processes that you have, which can include human rights components, supplier and sales screening processes, employee surveys or other consultation processes can be used here. Um, grievance mechanisms and complaint, complaint channels can be a really um, powerful tool to kind of to identify risk and use those as a kind of early warning system for risks that might um, uh, escalate into, into something else and also kind of you know, maybe uh, nip grievances in the bud earlier. And there are a kind of increasing number of um, tech-assisted tools, like Lisa mentioned Echovardis, which is a kind of service provider which can be used here. There's also um, web or phone-based worker voice um, tools allowing for workers and in, um, in some cases communities to anonymously report issues which affect them to the company. Um, and there has been this proliferation of third-party tools, um, many of them privately owned and developed by those offering paid services um, to trace and monitor supply chains or provide kind of uh, dashboards for kind of real-time um, overview of, of a, risk, a company's risk profile. Um, there's been a kind of huge explosion in industry here. There's been a kind of a massive number of <laughs> consultancies offering services here. Um, and that can be somewhat difficult for businesses to navigate and does uh, create some challenges of, you know, quality or alignment with international standards, other services that these kind of companies are um, offering, um, meeting the expectations of the UNGPs or the coming legal requirements. I think that there are some, some questions to be asked there, but nonetheless they do um, provide valuable services in some cases which can enable companies to conduct due diligence if they use as a component of a broader due diligence process, um, as Lisa said, they do with Yara. Um, so I'll close by saying that um, identification is like obviously a critical first step um, in the human rights due diligence process, um, enabling a, a business to understand what impacts it has on, on people. Um, but if the process is done well, it can also have other benefits. So um, bringing in um, different functions within your business can help build capacity internally on human rights by really um, helping them kind of uh, understand what kinds of impacts the business can have, um, enables them to identify impacts on a kind of ongoing basis, not just as a, through a kind of initial identification process. Um, it'll help you to design more effective measures to ident address identified impacts. If you have a robust identification process, then, uh, well, you can only d d design an effective measure if you have a robust identification process and are correctly identifying uh, where your risks are. And by involving and including rights holders and other affected stakeholders, it can also be a real opportunity to build relationships with people affected by the operations of a business, to be informed by their experience and to design effective actions. And it can also boost the company's social license to operate and reduce instance, instances of grievances or things that might escalate into litigation, for example. So I think there's a lot to unpack with identification. I hope I've given you a bit of an introduction here and a bit of an introduction into one methodology, human rights impact assessment that can be used. But of course, welcome questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gabrielle. And again, uh, we'll save questions from the audience for a moment, but just to ask if there are any immediate reactions from... Uh, Perhaps from just Thomas. one very quick on the issue of different consultancies mm -hmm. uh, that are popping out out of nowhere um, with people that real experts never heard of out of a sudden declaring that they've got like 20 years of experience in implementing ESG. So just perhaps just a word of warning, be careful about whom you choose, because if you choose wrongly, you might just spend money and get more into troubles than actually finding the right solution for a problem that you might have. So just be careful about whom you choose. Check credentials. Yeah. You, you said that more directly than I did. <laughs> yes, I know. I, I've got the privilege of being from NGOs, so uh, yes, I can be slightly less <laughs> cautious and politically correct. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Thanks for this advice. Yes, please. Yeah. yeah. No, I think uh, Gabriel co covered uh, many of the elements uh, already, but I just uh, made a note because you said... Um, you know, integrate human rights into policies and procedures, mm. uh, but ensure that the risks to rights holders uh, are sort of uh, protected and taken care of in that process. Mm. And I'll give one practical example mm. of that. Uh, for instance, uh, risk assessment of your supply chain and suppliers. Um, 
Initially, it's it's very um, common to have uh, spend, for instance, as one of your cr critical factors in terms of risk assessing which suppliers to uh, to audit or to have other measures against. But if you take the the risk to the rights holders, the risk to people uh, in the forefront, uh, the spend is less significant. Mm -hmm. So that means, for instance, looking at the country risk and the industry risk. Uh, because in our case, for example, uh, a small warehouse with uh, 20 employees might be more risky than one of the bigger companies that will pop up on our mm -hmm. list because the spend is higher. Mm -hmm. So you need to have a critical approach to how you do your risk assessment uh, process. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. And then I just had another comment as well on the human rights impact assessment. One thing I didn't mention, which uh, was very valuable to us, and why I would really recommend doing these types of exercises is we used external experts to, to come in and do mm. these assessments. And just getting external eyes mm. on your practices, mm. having that human rights lens is extremely useful. Because in our case, we weren't breaching any local laws, for instance. Nobody was going to come in and arrest us for what we were doing. But just having somebody come in and question, okay, you're within the boundaries of local law. But is this really the standard mm. that you want to have at your company? So, uh, yeah, I think uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. I think this is a good transition now uh, yeah. to um, Roger Brannigan. Uh, Brannigan. Brannigan. Uh, and I think you are also representing ENAC uh, with a lot of experience in undertaking this kind of advice and uh, and risk assessment for businesses as well. Uh, yes, yes, I'm uh, from the U.S., but I'm professionally based in Stockholm. Yeah. Uh, can you bring up the slides? You can uh, kill the comments. I think those are Aaron put on the the guide here. I don't know I if think you that's need... okay. Oh, good. That's that's all that's coming up. Very good. Very good. Um, yes, I've been asked to talk about how you uh, assuming that the risk um, identification and assessment process has been completed what steps companies can take to prevent and mitigate harm. Um, the easy part. Um, the, uh, and I'll try to do that in 10 minutes uh, and also because I really want to hear from you what your thoughts are. Uh, and I'll, I'll try to conclude using an example because I think hypotheticals uh, based on real-world scenarios can sometimes frame these issues more effectively than, than um, going through a series of bullet points. But just in brief, um, where the controller is. If you can. Thank you. Who I am, um, in 30 seconds or less. Uh, I'm a lawyer by background and training. I spent 20 years or more in uh, risk-based due diligence litigation and risk management before I came to this space, uh, primarily representing banks, uh, other financial institutions, um, uh, large insurers and construction companies and worked on big cases including Canary Wharf and the World Trade Center case. Um, it was in for that reason that one of my former colleagues, one of John Ruggie's lieutenants, um, um, Andrea Schemberg, who now heads up uh, GBI, asked me uh, to join uh, John Ruggie's legal roundtable during the UNGP multi-stakeholder consultation and since that time I've been moved more uh, into this space and have been working full-time in it for several years. Uh, what I do is I go out in the field, uh, I conduct field assessments, but what we also call process gap analyses and risk management evaluations. So I go out with a team, um, I've been around the world, Southeast Asia, Brazil, Guatemala, um, uh, Estonia, Poland, uh, but also various places in Africa, uh, Zimbabwe, Ghana, conducting these kinds of uh, assessments, but also meeting with suppliers primarily uh, and sub-suppliers to evaluate the business processes they have in place to try to uh, uh, prevent and mitigate harm and to develop risk management strategies for them, uh, for, my, for my clients and for their suppliers. So my interest is in practical tools for preventing, mitigating, and managing human rights risk. You've seen this diagram before. I'm not going to spend any time on it. What's important to me from this diagram is 
not the individual steps, but how often it's been, how often it's repeated. Uh, in my experience, if this process is an annual process that only results in a report being issued every six months or a year or maybe longer than that, it's not as effective as having a cyclical process that can be repeated on an ongoing basis as part of a program of continuous improvement. So these steps have been explained before, but one of the goals in actually effectively preventing and mitigating harm is to repeat this process, especially when it comes to engaging stakeholders, uh, because stakeholders play an important role, uh, not just as the objects of managing risk, preventing harm, but also as important sources of information, as I'll, I'll get to in just a moment. Um, We've had a lot of discussion today about the CS, Triple D, as we call it, whether it's fate, whether it's going to survive, uh, whether it's going to be adopted, and if so, in what form. Um, in my experience working with my clients, that's actually one of a, it's important. Um, compliance is important, but it's not the primary driver. It's not the reason why they have undertaken human rights due diligence. Uh, it's to prevent and mitigate harm. It's really based more on their desire to build a strong corporate identity uh, as a company that cares about people throughout its value chain. They've undertaken it to promote more a more ethical and attractive work culture and work environment. Uh, it's been very, I've been fortunate to work, work with some companies that have been very progressive in this regard, but they have actually seen improvements not just in their recruiting, but also employee morale, uh, 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 how uh, employees feel about working for the company based on the due diligence that they've conducted. And uh, the companies I work for, I have understood that you can better understand risk, people-related risks, and uh, understand the company's capacity to respond to those risks by looking at issues, risks from a, a human rights perspective through that lens. Because often companies that are responsible when it comes to human rights are also better managed in other key respects. And over time, as you develop systems, you can actually draw, see those correlations. You can see the value that the company derives from managing risk more effectively by um, conducting human rights due diligence. I don't mean to downplay compliance. It's important, but it's the least important dr driver in, in, uh, with the companies that I have uh, worked with. Um, I was asked for a comment, um, to post a comment uh, uh, as, as part of this um, conference, uh, kind of summarizing uh, my philosophy. And if I had to do so, and I, I did, it, I said this, for human rights due diligence to be effective, policy, processes, and people all have to keep pace. And what I mean by that is that even though the prevention and mitigation strategies, uh, including remediation and grievance mechanisms, are going to vary by business sector, by operating context, um, most effective HRDD programs share three features that are based on policy, process, and people. The three are clear communication of a strategy through a range of actions that the company is committed to addressing human rights risk. Often companies will adopt policies. They may also adapt their codes of conduct or their supplier codes of conduct. But the most effective way of communicating the company's commitment to human rights is also then to bake that into purchasing and contracting policies, procurement policies, and defined accountabilities, which I think uh, the other panelists have, have, have talked about. Communicating, not just internally but externally, that there are people who are responsible for overseeing human rights risks who are tasked with, depending on the severity of addressing it, taking it seriously within the company and addressing it um, uh, through, through uh, defined action. The second is an iterative pro um, a developing an, interest, an inter excuse me, iterative process based on practical metrics that track and triangulate corporate inputs as well as impacts on people. That means that you look not only at what the company is doing in terms of its input, its trainings, its audits, but also make sure that you incorporate outcomes, impacts on people. You, this is a, a, a very difficult task, so it's, it's, it is important to prioritize your risks and start small so that you can develop the process internally, bringing different parts of the company along as you're developing the process. The third component is systematic and sustained dialogue with stakeholders or their 
proxies, NGOs, or others who represent them, because stakeholders, again, play three important roles. They're sources, important sources of data, information about risk and impact. They're important collaborators, because often they know more about what actually is going to work on the ground than um, experts who are come in from the outside. And finally, they are the affected rights holders. So um, I wanted to finish with an example. It's a hypothetical example drawn from some companies I worked with, but this is an example of how you can develop more effective prevention and mitigation uh, based on the three steps I just talked about. The client in this case purchased raw material inputs from suppliers in developing economies through commodities traders. It's a very common practice. Those raw material suppliers varied greatly in terms of their size and their maturity, their resources, and their internal processes. The workers in that sector, uh, the raw material sector, were at risk of substandard pay, not receiving any, any benefits, working in unsafe conditions, and exploitation, especially by firms in that unlicensed companies that were seeking cost advantages by taking advantage of um, taking advantage of workers. The company, my client, asked the suppliers to address labor abuses, but they still often pay the lowest price available in the open market. As a result, suppliers resisted changes to making any improvements until the client implemented a new prevention and mitigation plan. And these were the components. In terms of strategy and accountability, before it was a, uh, Human Rights was a sustainability department initiative. Other company functions, especially those who communicated and interacted directly with affected rights holders, were not involved. The shift after the new plan was implemented was to include procurement and the purchasing and quality assurance departments in that process. They share lead with sustainability. That was important both for um, bringing insights to those departments, but also allowing them to implement human rights due diligence in the course of ordinary business, buying, buying and, and selling uh, commodities. There was a policy and code of conduct in place, but then that was supported afterwards with clear standards and specific purchasing requirements that purchasers would be expected to address human rights risks if they were going to be um, if, if the company was going to purchase material from them. There was no supplier contract or financial support for companies. After the, uh, the plan was implemented, there was a preferred purchasing program with price supports and extended contract terms. So the, my client was able to go to, this, uh, to these suppliers and say, if you implement due diligence, we're going to do a couple of things for you. We're going to su uh, support you in terms of price, and we're also going to give you extended contract terms. We know this is a long-term investment, so we know that and, and the, the, the market price is going to vary. So we're going to lock in your prices within certain parameters to give you the resources that you need to address the problem. In terms of due diligence, there was a supplier code of conduct, but there were no performance metrics. We put into place a, a basic set of performance metrics based on the most salient or the most serious risks. Um, they were small but they were defined and achievable and could be measured periodically over time. Um, that input was supported by other sources of information, including NGOs and government sources. And finally, in terms of stakeholder engagement, there was no sustained engagement with worker representatives. Afterwards, NGOs and unions were asked to give their input, and the company also helped support new grievance mechanisms and remedies. So. To recap, in order to have an effective prevention and mitigation strategy, you need to have a clear strategic commitment, dedication of resources, and contract incentives, especially to suppliers who may not be positioned um, to, to, to uh, do this on their own. You have to define clear accountabilities and responsibilities, especially in functions that directly interact with affected communities and rights holders. You need to start small by prioritizing the most severe risks. You need to have both input and impact-based metrics as part of a system of continuous improvement. And you need to have sustained rights holder dialogue. So I probably run over my time, so I'll stop there. 
Thank you. Yeah. Again, once again, thanks for uh, taking us through the different steps of, uh, of, of corporate due diligence, human rights due diligence. Are there any immediate feedbacks from our fellow panelists? Not, well, yeah. nothing major, just to say is that, um, because the last examples that, that you showed kind of shows very nice, kind of very complex and complete picture. Um, and just to say is that sometimes, for some companies at least, um, some of the companies that asked us for help, like when you when we painted kind of the whole picture, they just basically got scared at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes it just really helps people really to understand. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what was your experience, but our was that uh, getting at the beginning, like a cross-functional kind of group of managers mm -hmm. trying to provide them with, I would say, some sort of educational component with some training on what the whole business and what the whole human rights, respect for human rights is about, and helping them to understand how it might fit into their everyday operations, that it's not just some sort of external add-on that has nothing to do with them, but that it really intertwines with, with their work. We just found that, it's, um, that it was very helpful in getting some small steps at the beginning. I don't know if if yeah, no, I think tra tra yeah, training and capacity building is really yes, important. And also just mm -hmm. repeating the process. I think coming from a risk management background, sometimes companies are hesitant to start um, and they, they don't know where to begin. And starting the process, even with a limited amount of information based on your most severe risk, it may be five or ten indicators, pieces of data you need to collect and evaluate. Starting small and repeating the process is as important as having a comprehensive uh, program. It may grow into that over time, but that allows the rest of the company to keep pace. As I said, these other functions, procurement, quality mm -hmm. assurance, who and managers who need to be part of the process. Exactly, thanks. I can just uh, echo on that and the, the value of uh, including uh, several departments into your human rights work because human rights falls into every single department in the organization, right? So it's often led by a sustainability team or in our case, ethics and compliance. It's easy to kind of power through and do your own thing and work in, in silos. But uh, tying in other teams and sort of creating accountability across the board, it's uh, essential. And again, I'm talking a lot about human rights impact assessments, <laughs> but, uh, but that has been key as well because it involves several departments locally, right? Because it's HR, it's HESC, it's uh, the sustainability people, it's procurement, and it just creates a lot of uh, knowledge raising uh, internally and locally as well. Great, thank you. And uh, Beata, you'll uh, take us a step forward again and with a special focus on stakeholder engagement, which has uh, been touched upon, but a very important dimension of everything also because it's about shifting focus to some degree from narrow profit maximization to a wider sense of the sustainability of business operations, if I understand. Uh, yes, indeed. And although I have to say that after all the interventions that were already <laughs> made, uh, it, it will be more of a sum up and wrapping, wrapping it up rather than uh, covering it from the start. Um, but indeed, I was asked to speak today about the meaningful stakeholder engagement. And um, I would say for a number of companies, or but also stakeholders, other NGOs that we are talking uh, to, I would say we always get, well, not always, but very often we get impressions that people kind of say, oh, you know, it's some sort of very vague concept, a stakeholder engagement. And very often there is very little realization that it's actually one of the very key components, one of the key elements of the human rights due diligence. And um, that, in fact, really whether you engage properly with your stakeholders, and we'll get to that, who they are in a moment, I mean, it really can make a difference between a successful operation and a failed business. I mean, one of my favorite examples is by Christina Butter, who in her book about uh, corporate idealists uh, writes about one of the very um, sensitive investments, which was possible to be carried and completed on time only because there was a very serious engagement and stakeholder engagement uh, with the local populations that had to be resettled to make place uh, for the... Um, for the investments which, due to the uh, localization, had to be built on this very specific spot. So 
be, being able to talk to your stakeholders is really, really important. And when we talk about stakeholders, we obviously talk about any really individual group who may affect or be affected by the company, uh, by basically by any organization and its activities. And those can be your, I mean, we talk about internal, external stakeholders. So uh, we will be talking about your workers, employees, um, depending on the structures. There will be people who are from the different uh, employment and recruitment agencies that you are using um, in your production processes. Those will be also uh, local authorities, national governments, academic community, uh, I mean, you name it, uh, local communities, obviously, as well. Uh, but what differs, there is a difference between this very big pool of stakeholders um, and an affected stakeholder, which is basically an individual uh, whose human rights have been affected by your operations or your products or services or through your uh, business relationships. And when you look into the UNGPs, they kind of differentiate between three different groups of stakeholders. So you've got those rights holders, which I would say you can easily use slash affected stakeholders with the rights holders. But basically those are the people whom you are affecting, whose human rights you are affecting through your operations. Then you have credible proxies and those, I mean, there are some situations when you won't be able to talk to um, directly to the rights holders, be it for cultural issues or for a number of other um, reasons. And then you kind of, you can look for people who can really legitimately represent them and who have sufficiently deep experience to really provide you with the feedback from them or who can act also as an intermediary between you and that group. Then you've got also very explicitly mentioned human rights experts, but it's very important not to kind of assume that human rights expert will tell you everything that the right holder uh, would, because this will lead you really into the dark very often. Uh, human rights experts know about human rights, but they won't know necessarily all the details about what your, for example, worker is experiencing on the factory line. So, and this is really crucial. Um, one of the very key um, actors in the stakeholder dialogue are obviously trade unions and other workers' representatives or uh, different workers' councils because they can act in a dual way. I mean, actually, they've got a number of functions apart from representing uh, workers, but they can also just act as a channel also for you to get the uh, grievances and complaints. They can act also as the medium to disseminate information about some important elements. Uh, but most importantly, they can obviously engage as, a, um, as an actor in your dialogue with the workers. Um, one of the very key issues is to not focus on the most influential stakeholders. It's the same kind of with the, as with the sale issue, that it's, it's companies are always very tempted to examine suppliers who are kind of providing them the biggest, um, um, kind of the, bigger, the biggest number of products or um, to whom they are paying the biggest number, of, the biggest um, prices, whatever. Um, but basically, you should be looking for those who are the most marginalized and who are most vulnerable. Um, so it's not enough to, to really have a proper stakeholder dialogue to, for example, have a just all workforce meeting, for example, in our case, in Polish only, when you know that half of the workforce is Ukrainian, for example. And because if you organize it in Polish, there is no way that you'll get proper input from the Ukrainian workers or workers of any other nationality. I mean, it's not enough to consult only men uh, in the company because they will have, well, very little idea about the experiences of women. And they might just not come across the idea that, you know, if you are pregnant, it would be actually nice to have a parking spot somewhere closer uh, to the entrance to the building and not at the very edge of the parking lot. Um, you might not necessarily know that women's skin is 10% thinner than men's which means that your exposure to chemical ingredients if you are working on a factory line, or even if you are just kind of cleaning the floors within the university, I mean, that you will be just simply more exposed to the toxic um, influences. So 
we very often know that very often um, state norms are actually set at the level which is safe for men simply because it was done this way for a number of ages. And I very recommend the book Invisible Women. Um, so if you are a responsible employer, if you're a responsible company, you should kind of talk to scientists and find out what you need to do is really complying uh, with the national legislation with respect to those norms enough to guarantee the right to health. And we are currently, for example, assisting one of the companies in trying to understand their impact. And we've been talking to, for example, labor inspectors to find out what are the areas in law which, in their opinion, kind of require change, because this will give us kind of indication which issues companies should be looking at. Because if this is something that, uh, in the opinion of the labor law inspection, requires change, then it's very likely something that might require additional attention from the companies. Um, so, as you have seen, the um, stakeholders don't necessarily fully overlap with the right holders, but it's uh, quite a significant group. Um, so when we are talking about the stakeholder engagement, we are really talking about a, an ongoing process. And it was said a number of times, so um, the whole human rights due diligence cycle. So we are really talking about an ongoing process of interaction and dialogue between the enterprise or any organization for that matter, and its affected or potentially affected stakeholders. That, and the aim of this um, interaction of this engagement is for the company to hear, but also understand and respond to those rights, interests, concerns, and ideally through the collaborative approaches, which sometimes are possible and sometimes are unfortunately not. And you've got also, OP, and there is plenty of text, so you don't have to read it through, you'll get the presentation, it's just, I just wanted for you to have everything on one place. Um, so when we kind of look one of the sentences, uh, one of the phrases that was said a number of times throughout the day today was, like, if done well. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and it's really the key issue. It's, if done right, it's the right, well, um, the right way. The stakeholder engagement can really create an opportunity for, like, a real dialogue between the parties. And it's not something that happens overnight. It's not that you'll kind of, like, for the first time ever, uh, you'll ask your employees to fill in the questionnaire or to come to a meeting and you will out of a sudden realize that if it's voluntary, it will be just a small group or that you'll get very hesitant responses. To build, building trust takes time. And one of the things that we are always uh, warning, uh, I mean, that's one of the elements when we try to talk to the board is to warn them, like, are you really willing to go into this process? Are you going to follow through what you are currently saying that you are implementing human rights due diligence? Because if you start now to talk to people about like, you know, I want to be better, I want to make sure that I respect your human rights, and then you just basically halfway through, because you find the findings not so great or not as you have expected them, and you stop halfway through or just go back, I mean, you'll lose the credibility or the level of trust that you have right now. So think twice. Um, and the level of engagement, I mean, engaging in stakeholder engagement can really take different forms. It can be an issue of just talking to the cleaning lady um, within your uh, facilities, kind of you know, how she's treated. Does she have sufficient uh, adequate personal protection to prevent from getting exposed to different chemicals? Uh, it's about making sure that people who are coming into your factory very often, okay, I, I'm not sure actually how it's in uh, Latvia, but in Poland we have a huge issue with uh, very high, level, uh, high numbers of workers being employed through the employment agencies on temporary contracts and in all different various forms that they shouldn't be necessarily employed uh, on. And very often the only proper time uh, when you have contact with such person is during the health and safety training, when they are coming, when they are entering the, your facilities, your production facilities. And this is the moment when you can hand out, for example, information and raise the issue of like, you know, we've got this pickup channel, we've got this hotline. If something is going wrong, uh, if you are not being paid on time by your agency, if you're not being paid on time by your supplier, uh, you know, by the contractor who is uh, helping us with uh, with that, to whom we are outsourcing this uh, service, do let us know. 
So there are ways where you can already at this early stage kind of encourage a person who is coming to work for you um, to be more open and show that it's important. And if you do that initially, I mean, obviously there are different um, surveys that you can run, but also think when you run them. If it's your first contact, probably the response rate will be low and you won't get proper answers. If it's like three months into their work for you or within your facilities, they are more likely to provide you with an honest answer, particularly if they have seen, if they had feedback that some complaints by other people were actually successful. So, um, I mean, there are so, so many different small ways through which you can build trust and, and engagement. And a number of things have been said about you know, how um, engaging people can lower the risk of conflict and lower the risk of litigation. And obviously, you've seen this cycle a number of times, but stakeholder engagement really goes through all the stages. And if you involve people not only in identifying the problem, and again, if we stay with workers, I mean, those are the people that know what's not working properly. They are the people who will tell you, like, you know, I start to hear this weird sound. Perhaps we should shift and kind of... Uh, do the renovation like in one month's time and not in one year time when it's scheduled. I mean, it can save you plenty of money if you listen to people. So, but also, uh, and why? I mean, on one hand, it will be good for your business, no a broken machine. On the other hand, no risk of people getting harmed because the machine is not working properly, right? So it's kind of win-win uh, in a number of things. If you look together for solutions, people are more likely to implement those solutions. They are more likely to go along. They are more likely to help you um, really carry it through. I mean, we've heard from a company that invested like three million slot into different uh, protection mechanisms in the company. And what we've heard from the workers was like, you know, they've just spent so much money on some useless stuff instead of giving us a raise. So unless you engage people, you just might not know what they want, what they need. You might not have the opportunity to explain why you do it. Um, so there are a number of things like that. So it, and it just goes through. If you want to monitor what's happening on the ground, you just you can actually involve um, people again. Um, it was um, the lady has raised the issue of you know of the audits and when the suppliers are not willing to submit to audits. Um, either halfway through the contract or not even when entering into a new contract. Uh, but you can contact workers directly in a way. You c there are different ways, there are different applications, and sometimes you can learn from those proxy um, people more than you would do through like a direct third party audit. Uh, there are some examples from Pakistan, but I think I'm kind of over the time, so I'll be speeding up. Um, so what meaningful and effective stakeholder engagement looks like? I mean, it is ongoing. It was said a number of times. It's based on dialogue. It's, it shouldn't be just one-way street. You have to start somewhere. So obviously, the communication from your side is important. But, I mean, later on, try to engage in dialogue, sometimes directly, sometimes use third, uh, third party actors, use consultants, use NGOs, because... Sometimes people will be obviously more open to speak to somebody who can guarantee um, their anonymity. Um, and there are different ways, like focus groups and so on, where if, if it's a third party who is doing interviews, it's kind of easier because people just know, okay, this will be anonymized and the, the company will get the report. So um, that's that. It needs to be accessible. So it's... Assuming that because everybody at the headquarters has access to smartphone and that it's enough to send out a survey through an application on the newest iPhone, well, it might not work for your workforce on the factory line simply because people might not necessarily afford the equipment that is necessary to actually upload this or download this application. So sometimes you'll need to revert to more paper uh, surveys and other uh, ways to do that. I mean... Stakeholder engagement needs to be safe for your, um, um, I mean, for the stakeholders, obviously, and it needs to be focused on their rights, interests, and concerns. Um, with safety, I mean, there are different ways to do it. Sometimes, like we are doing currently consultations on LGTB rights in business, 
And because we know this issue is very thorny, particularly in Central Asia, we are giving people opportunity to, as an, uh, as an exception, to kind of keep their um, cameras off and to register under alias, to provide us with their real identity, but provide also alias under which they'll log in so that we know who is logging in, so that we can create safe environment, but that they don't necessarily can be identified by others. Um, and stakeholder dialogue can really go from those ad hoc individual interactions to a very complex collaborative uh, platforms that I'm afraid we don't have more time. Just pointing out that companies are really underusing uh, stakeholder engagement. And currently just around like 27% of companies examined by the corporate human rights benchmark actually do implement stakeholder engagement at different levels of human rights due diligence. And when it comes to seeking solutions, only under 5%. So that's, I would say, hugely unused potential. And that's probably the outcome of the old CSR logic where you are kind of using stakeholder engagement just as a one-off meeting to inform what people want to read in your report. That's not the way. Actually, even this standard provides it with much more than it's been used for. And there are a number of other uh, sources. So thank you very much. And you'll get some other links in the presentation. And sorry for being too long, probably. Well, thank you. And it's... Uh, sorry. Please. Especially interesting also because, as you said, it's an area of human rights due diligence that is often not as uh, much in focus as it probably no. should be, you know, and so for that reason it's also worth really uh, going into the, into the topic, so I pre we appreciate that very much. I think we should now move on to the uh, taking questions. I mean, we can also, again, invite our fellow panelists for a, a quick response or comment, but we can do that in the context maybe of a general discussion with the, with the audience because we should have a little time for that too.